this administration might or they already are destroying America. And it's up to us as a generation to stand up and speak out against what this administration is doing. And I think in the next two years, it's also about fighting against socialism, communism, and Marxism that so many of my generation are fighting for. And in reality, democratic socialism is literally just socialism. That's all it is. And so I'm hoping that people take the time and realize that socialism is detrimental. This is the last place on earth for freedom, and we need to continue to fight for freedom, and we need to stand up against socialism being implemented in this country because it's awful, it's disgusting, and these policies will tear people apart and it will destroy our country. The Biden administration literally being authoritarian is not helping our country whatsoever. And I hope people realize that liberal policies don't really work. And I'm hoping more people wake up and do their own research. Hi, everybody. My name is Kyle, and this is The Conservative Take. We take culture, TV, movie, news, and politics and filter to you the right way. If this is your first time here, then please consider hitting that like and subscribe button and that bell icon so you don't miss any future content. Also, if you want to help us, subscribe to us, join us, support what we're trying to do here, then please, by all means, hit that join button and find out how to do just that. And for all you people who have been on this channel for, for a while now, you know that I love to do interviews with people who I find are up and coming, people who are inspiring, who are pretty much new to YouTube or new to the conservative movement. This person doesn't necessarily qualify on the conservative movement, but she does qualify in terms of a new YouTube presence at least. And so I watch all of her videos. They're really compelling. And I want to introduce you to this young uh, lady. Her name is Kira Bowlby, and she is great. And I, I, I met her on Facebook and I vetted her to make sure she was legit. And I saw her channel and was just really, really inspired by what she had to say. And I think you will find the same thing as well. So right now I'd like to introduce you to uh, Kira. Kira, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Oh, you're, you're absolutely welcome. And, uh, you know, some of you know, I do these multiple entries differently because I actually make some mistakes. So we did this the second time. So this is the second time we're running this. But um, so she had an introduction and I'm going to have her say that again. Uh, so the question for me, uh, Kira, and by the way, thank you so much for coming on here tonight. It's uh, in your time. I think it's two hours different from where I am. So it's, it works for me perfectly. But uh, for me, let me ask you a question. How did you get into the YouTube market? The, the whole uh, space of conservative movement now, especially in the times we are at right now? Yeah, so I actually got involved in the conservative movement when I was really little. I remember actually watching the presidential debates with my parents. And I was sitting in my high school classroom, my history class. I was a sophomore in high school, and I had a teacher who was very liberal, hated Republicans, and he would just hate on me all the time. When I came out as a conservative, I remember sitting in class, we were doing a mock election and people actually moved their chairs away from me so that they didn't have to sit next to me. And I remember sitting in class and I was thinking to myself, I was around all these people who hated America. And I remember thinking to myself, well, if no one else is going to stand up for conservative values, then I need to. And so I started getting involved and I'm involved with a lot of organizations um, in the conservative movement. I started a YouTube channel because I really want to run for office someday. That's my biggest goal. Um, and I also am thinking about just going into politics somehow. And I remember talking to someone in the conservative movement about how to get more of an audience building because I really want to reach more of an audience. And they told me to start making YouTube videos. So I started making YouTube videos um, for my channel. My YouTube videos are mostly about current events. And so I really just want to kind of bring my voice into the conservative movement and make videos that I want to make. And I want to kind of get my point across about what I want the future of our country to look like. So that's kind of how I got involved with the conservative movement and in social media. And yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Kira, um, I, I really find it interesting. And I talk to people who are especially who are young and conservative because like you said, I mean, my goodness, you are in a classroom and people move their chairs physically from you. That, yeah. that That's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so to that end, I'm like, I'm fascinated by people who decide to get into this, to, into this space. And obviously 
uh, people who are who do that have a certain certain characteristics about themselves. And you and, uh, mentioned that in some of your videos. I will let people go see that. By the way, go check out her video. I'm going to put all the links uh, to her social media in the in the links below. And it may this it may be on her channel as well. But I'm going to put it down below. Go check out her videos, and you'll find out for yourself. But uh, the question I like to ask again, as I'm getting around the subject to say this, is uh, how do you feel it is? I mean, how is it that you got to this place? I, I think you mentioned your parents or were high influences on this. Is that, is that how you've always been? There was never a conversion moment or a walkaway moment for you? Um, when I was in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was just kind of feeling my way around certain things. I hated history in middle school. Um, I hated U.S. history. I was just, I, fa I found it kind of boring, if I'm being completely honest. And I just, I hated school. I grew up and I was diagnosed with dyslexia at a really young age. So I had to work harder than everyone else in my classes. And school has just always been super hard for me. So for me personally, I kind of got to this point by just kind of doing my research and I saw like I said before I saw what the left was doing to our country and they're literally trying to destroy it and I was terrified and I just kind of had that moment in my life when I was about um when I was 16 years old um and I had that moment where I was just like you know what if no one else is gonna fight for our country I lived in such a liberal place that I knew I needed to get involved. So that's kind of where I got to this point now. And I really just want to also stand up for people who feel like their voices aren't heard. I've had a lot of instances where I've been bullied and I've been threatened to be doxxed by people. Um, I've been bullied by practically an entire sorority before. I actually joined a sorority and recently dropped out because I was getting bullied so much and I was getting threatened and um, I mostly just got to this point because I just want to fight for our country. So, yeah, you know, I, I hate that that happened to you. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, obviously I don't mention this a lot, but it's pretty obvious. I'm a, I'm a black man in America and I, I've never mentioned that, but I do like talking to people who, who are, are that because there's a common, there's a commonality in terms of like walking away and having the, having the, um, the other side come against you hard. And then I was just shocked to hear when I was speaking with several um, Hispanics and Latinos, same thing. And then I'm hearing it from people like yourself. I'm like, it doesn't matter what your background is or your color or your makeup or your, or your gender. It's about the ideas. And, and that's what really compelled me. And when you said that you like sticking up for those who, who don't, I think that was what really, really inspired me because it takes a lot of courage to do that and to have principles that you have. And I will first commend you for, for taking those positions. And, and um, so, um, so do you feel at this point now that things are, people are just accepting who you are now, or is it still, I mean, I know you have in your videos, you talk about how you can handle it, but how do you feel it's handling now with your new uh, approach and people know who you are now? Um, a lot of, I don't have a lot of friends. Um, so I struggle a lot. With that, a lot of people don't really want to be around me. A lot of people find me intimidating, to be honest. Um, so a lot of there are a lot of people that I know who accept me and who love me regardless of my political beliefs. But it is hard. I'm not going to lie. Um, I think now more people are starting to accept the fact that I am conservative. But I do genuinely get a lot of hate. And sometimes it's an everyday thing where I wake up and I find messages from random people who don't even know me who want me to die or who want me to die in my sleep. I got a message um, a few weeks ago from someone at my university threatening to release my address and they also were just attacking me. So the hate is pretty hard, but honestly, most people are kind of accepting me now and I feel like it's getting a lot better. But before, when I first got into politics, I had a really rough time with the bullying because when the first time you get called names, it's really difficult because it's so sad that strangers actually genuinely believe that you're an awful person and they've never taken the time to meet you. So that's what's really hard. But I feel like nowadays, more people are starting to understand that, you know, this is who I am. And if they don't like it, then they don't have to be friends with me. Yeah, I, I like that, especially in, in your video, your last video that you mentioned that. And you know, I think for me, it's 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 a matter of 
of it's, it's your ideas that they don't like. And I think part of it is the fact that they don't have the ability to really articulate their own positions. And so they, they're, they're being fed by Comedy Central, they're being fed by CNN, and all of a sudden they're being painted a narrative that tells them that we're all evil, you know? Yeah. And if you believe that, then you're going to act that way. And so I think that's where we get this stuff from because people are just ignorant. And I think I like your approach, and this is my, this is my next question here, um, and especially in light of what you just told me. You're, you're looking at, a, 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 at an approach of love, okay? Because me personally, Back in my college days, where I was more of a black militant, anti-establishment, really, and sort of a, a racist, I guess. I didn't really like white people that much. You know? um, mm. <laughs> I didn't. I was just, I was, I had that walk away movement right around 9-11. I became the exact opposite. Um, however, I was never about love, loving your enemy. But you seem, you seem, and you and also Angel Kiros, another friend of mine who's a YouTuber, says about taking the approach of, of love and understanding. I, I really appreciate that because I'm not sure I can, I, I need to work on that one. So, what do you what and what do you think that brings when it comes to stuff like this, when it comes to people who totally don't like you, who don't know who, who don't know about you, but you come at them in an opposite way that they would expect you to treat them? In other words, treat them with courtesy and respect and love. Um, for me, I genuinely like I said, I like to try and just be a nice person to everyone. Um and I really just try to live my everyday life in the name of trying to be more like people that I look up to. So sometimes when I'm going through a certain time or when people are being mean to me for no reason whatsoever, I like to think to myself, like, what would Jesus do in this situation? Like, or I really look, I really look up to people like Charlie Kirk, Candace Owens, um, just kind of thinking to myself, what would my inspirations do in this situation would they let it would, would they let it get to them or would they just move forward and growing up I had a lot of my mom is probably one of my biggest inspirations and she went through a lot of hate um she actually was a stem major during a time where it wasn't really accepted and wow. she always just kind of taught me to always just try and be a better person to be better than my enemies and to just wish them well. And I genuinely, when I get a rude comment from someone, normally I take a second and I take a step back and I pray for them or I have conversations with my family and sometimes I don't even respond. So I think it's like giving them the benefit of the doubt. At the end of the day, if I'm going to be a mean person to them, I'm gonna feel like an awful person because then I feel like I'm not being who I should be. And I think at the end of the day, you just have to be nice to people that don't like you and you have to just move forward and not let that get to you. That's fantastic. And, and that's fantastic. And because that's the way to do it. And I, I admit, I need better help in that area. But I think for me, I don't get the habitual hatred I used to get. I, I, I got that for a while, for many, many years. I don't get it as much. I guess people just say, well, that's just Kyle. But it's just, to me, it's just striking the new generation coming up, what they have to go through. And the fact that you're willingly going through this you know, for, for the behest of something bigger than yourself, I think uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, commendable. Um, I'm going to jump around here a little bit because you did mention something about people you admire. And in one of your videos, you mentioned someone that I really admire. And this person is by the name of by, from the city that I was born in, Frederick Douglass. And and I don't know a lot about Frederick Douglass. I do know that I, mean, I know the high level stuff, but you read his autobiography, you said, and you recommend that. Uh, what makes Frederick Douglass to you stand out as a person of inspiration? I think it was just what he gone through and kind of taking that situation. I can't even imagine what that would be like to go through that and to still at the end of the day, think America is such a great country and going through the unimaginable. I mean, one, someone once asked me, how would you characterize Frederick Douglass in one word? I would definitely say a warrior and he just inspires me each and every day to be thankful for what I have. And I just really look up to him and I think he's incredible. And I think everyone should read his story. He's just fantastic. I think before everyone dies, um, I think everyone should just read his story and look him up and he's incredible. And just the way that he has with words is just fantastic. So. Yeah. His birthplace is right. I grew up 
20 minutes from his, from where he, where he was born and I never went by his house. My mother was conservative, but they, they do, they're great parents and all that, but we just don't see eye to eye on politics. We just, we just don't talk about it. But, um, so obviously with your family, it sounds like your, your mother and father sounds like that's going really well. And that's also a blessing. So with, with Frederick Douglass, I, I, you also mentioned about us history. And one thing I like is the civil war. I like, I do tour the Gettysburg national military park in Pennsylvania and I, I just like that because it does give a perspective of America and what we're fighting for and why we're fighting for it. And I think that what you say and, and what you just told me um, stands um, stands to uh, to make sense to me and, and makes sense to my viewers, too, because I think by these people and you mentioned I'm going to get to your, your point here about um, liberal leftism and hypocrisy. So my question is, how how do you think liberal hypocrisy in terms of their not understanding this country or you mentioned, like, let me phrase it this way. You mentioned in one of your videos that yet they, they say they hate America, yet they're on their Zoom calls with their iPods, you know, and their, um, you know, their Macintosh, their MacBooks, whatever. And, but yet they don't understand the history. Can you kind of talk about that more about how the generation today doesn't really know about the Frederick Douglasses, the Civil War, the American Independence, the Founding Fathers, which you mentioned as well? Yeah, so I think that we're raising a generation, especially on college campuses, to be professional whiners and to be professional narcissists. So when they're hearing, so for example, when they hear something that they don't agree with, they go into a complete shutdown. And you can always like just look up conservative speakers coming to college campuses. At my college campus, we had Will Witt and Milo Giannopoulos come on campus. Mm -hmm. And Everyone was freaking out. People were protesting. Um, they thought that they were Nazis. And in reality, like a few months before Will Witt came to go speak on my campus at the University of New Mexico, um, I actually met him before. And I was like, why does everyone hate him? He's this normal, nice guy. So I think that when it comes to them not understanding American history, I think they're just I think they're kind of privileged. And I think they don't want to take the time to understand. And I don't think a lot of them have understand the constitution or the declaration of independence or our readings from our founding fathers, because even if they have read the constitution or the declaration of independence, I don't think they understand it because at the end of the day, they keep say, they keep talking about things like hate speech, for example, when the Supreme court has stated that hate speech laws and free speech zones on college campuses that's actually illegal. And for example, with the First Amendment, like you don't get to pick and choose what's hateful and what's not hateful. And I just think students on college campuses and just my generation in general, I think we're just raising a bunch of narcissists and professional whiners who have no idea what they're talking about. And they're just being fed with this indoctrination on college campuses. And it's honestly, if you look at it, it's terrifying. And I live this every day in my classes. So it's scary. I, I cannot imagine. And I was, I was watching your video uh, earlier today. I was thinking that, and I think part of the reason why they have to shut down is because they're, and I've said this many, many times, a broken record is that they just, well, th their ideas are horrible and they can't defend their ideas. And the further they get from the left, which is what Trump did by taking middle position, they hated him so much, it just forced him further to the left for no reason, for no reason at all. You know, they just lost a blue collar worker because they just hated Trump. And therefore, now they're off in Pango Pango land out here on the left in the wacko weirdo world. And now so they can't get they can't back away from it or defend it. So what do they do? They shut you down. Yeah, it's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> so um and speaking of which, one way they shut you down, you mentioned this as well. We talked, well, you didn't talk about this, but our, in, when we uh, uh, talked about what to talk about, uh, the big tech censorship, right? I mean, that's one thing that they can do, right? And not only to the media, that's kind of a big deal. But, and, and by the way, I will say this uh, you mentioned in one of your latest uh, Instagram stories, your situation with Instagram. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because it kind of goes into this big tech censorship and, and, you know, why they can't have us talk because their ideas don't make any sense and they can't defend them. Yeah, so I have two Instagram accounts. I have a main account and a backup account. And I was just kind of posting regular things. And all of a sudden, I got a notice from Instagram telling me that my account went against their community guidelines. They also stated that my account was promoting hate speech. And 
I remember sitting there thinking to myself, well, this sucks. And they told me that they were going to review my Instagram account on Saturday morning today. And they also said that they were going to look at it Friday morning. So on Friday, yesterday, they sent me an email saying that they made a mistake and that my Instagram account didn't violate their community guidelines. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, well, that makes sense because I'm not a violent person. I'm not a racist. I'm not, I'm not a bad person. I don't, I don't hate people. I'm not posting anything that's going against anything. I'm a good person and I have, you know, I want to have future aspirations to run for office. So why would I ever post anything that would ever even remotely have me not do that in the future? It didn't make sense to me. So they basically made a mistake and they failed and they saw me, a young conservative, voicing my opinions on social media and they got freaked out and it caught them off guard and I'm glad it did because it shows people that conservatives were not all violent and we're not all white supremacists like they say so I just thought it was a really big win for the conservative movement and it just shows that you know I'm not a violent person I don't I'm I condemn violence I condemned it over the summer when BLM incorporated was burning our country to the ground I condemned it during the Capitol riots that took place on January 6th. So I'm not a violent person and they found that out. So, yeah. yeah I actually had a video taken down on YouTube the day of the uh, January 6th. They actually took the video down. I was actually in uh, Gettysburg uh, in front of a monument talking about what was going on at the time it was happening. And I was just giving the facts that this is what's going on. And it got, it got removed. And I'm like, seriously, it's the first video I've ever had that I actually been literally been taken down. Now, of course I got a backup. I don't, you know, I can put it back up again. I'll probably put it up on rumble or somewhere, but I'm glad what you did is you stood up for yourself. You stood up for the entire movement because it's going to take people like yourself, right. And many, many more like you to do that, stand up and say, Hey, I'm not afraid of this. And in their defense, I'm not big on defending the left at all. You know, only about 30% of the, of, the, of, the, of the people in this country are really just whacked out. If you look at the polling numbers, they're the ones that are, are the wacky, whatever. And that 30%, that 30%, only about half of those are really the really crazy ones. I think what happens is people are so reactionary. Okay, companies are, they have money to worry about, and they cancel because they're listening to these, these Twitter blue checkers who have no, have no um, inkling or desire to support what they think they're supporting. They just loud, okay? And then they overreact and then they go off in false narratives. And next thing you know, they're attacking people like you either through the algorithm, which, which probably what it was. Right. And they just had, if it says, if you have Trump in your, in your algorithm somewhere, kick them out because we already have a predetermined notion that they're going to be, you know, that, that sort of thing. So um, I'm really happy you did that. Um, and I'm glad it worked out for you. And I'm, I'm con you continue to see that, but hopefully the more we do this, the better we'll, we'll see this um, come out in the future. So in our favor. So, yeah. so, um, tell me about, tell me about Trump CPAC speech, because it's kind of our open question. I, just, whatever you think about that, because he's talked about a lot in that, um, the fact that he either first just came out and, and talked for the first time since the election or anything specifically in it, his demeanor, um, the crowds that were out there, anything that you, your first, in, uh, thoughts when you're watching that and seeing what's going on around that whole event in Florida. Yeah, so I actually made a reaction video while I was watching the speech on my public political Facebook page. And I was just kind of blown away by what he was saying. And I really loved just like sitting down and like taking the time to like take in what he was saying. And I got so excited when he said he might run again in 2024. I was so excited, but I'm crossing my fingers. I hope he'll run, but if he doesn't run, I'm hoping other people will run hopefully a strong republican we don't need a rhino in office but i thought it was a really good speech and i really liked him kind of ragging on the biden administration and um because they aren't doing a great job they're actually doing a terrible job and i think that if if bush and if barack obama can have their voices and you know their what the other administration's doing, then Trump has the right to do that as well. And this election, in my opinion, was just not fair. So I think Trump should have the right to voice his opinions. And if people don't like it, then I feel like 
they don't have to watch it. And it's, it's really disgusting that they even removed him from Twitter and from other social media outlets because they thought he was inciting violence. So I just thought it was a really great speech. Yeah, I thought it was too. We did a live stream. We live streamed about four hours on that. And I got, or I, I didn't get this. Trump got this. I was just auxiliary to what he was doing. 12,000, roughly 12,000 views on this channel for, for a live stream, which is about 15 or 16 times bigger than our biggest live stream ever. <laughs> so, like, um, so obviously people, and he got way more than that across the, uh, yeah. you know, the internet. You know I mean? So, you know, I think I could talk about Trump for, forever. And... I mean <laughs> could you could, yeah. I mean, he's so. Let me just ask you a question. Let me get. Off, I'm get. Off, let me get off the script. Let me get off the script here, right? I got a script here. I'm going by. It's kind of what what you, what what do you like about Trump the most? Do you is it you know is it uh what what's your favorite attribute of him? Because that was one of the persons you said you wouldn't mind sitting down for dinner with. Oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> I just love how he carries himself. I know he's kind of controversial when it comes to that aspect, but I think he's so funny. And I love how he just doesn't care what people think of him. And I love his family. His family is incredible. Um, I actually went to the Student Action Summit with Turning Point USA in December of 2020. And it was so exciting because I got to see Donald Trump Jr. speak. And I remember just standing there like with my mouth wide open. It was crazy. And um, I've seen the president in person twice. And he's incredible. So... He, I just love how he carries himself, and I love how he just doesn't care what people think. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Um, I could go on about Trump. We may do it off off camera. People want to hear. People don't want to hear me talk, so I'm not going to go into what I, know, what I feel about it. But I 100 percent agree with you there. I've seen him a couple times. Uh, well, I saw him three times prior to him being elected, and twice. No, once. Once at present, my wife actually got a chance to. She got VIP seating behind the president. Which I was really jealous. And I got her on, you know, on C SPAN, not C SPAN, but um, RSBN. And I got a shot of her behind the president, like, so, <laughs> good, good for you. But um, yeah, we just really thoroughly enjoyed his administration. And you're right, he, I, I could just go on. And to, to, to piggyback what you said about the election, go back and look at my, this is not just you, but go back and look at my last 15 videos on this channel. Yeah. We, 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 you, you take it to see that? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we were. I mean, I was. I didn't sleep. I did about three or four all nighters. I had a war room of people who were part of this network. We literally were just on it, trying to get him back in there. And mm -hmm. what what was going on it was just something that needs to be discussed on Rumble because YouTube would not allow it. So I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was so surprised they allow my videos up because I said that Biden was um illegitimate and i and like i'm still shocked that they allowed the video up like it's still up it's still running you can still view it i was shocked but yeah i don't like biden i agree with 100 i disagree sorry with 100 percent of what he says and i'm just really upset that i'm i'm upset of the outcome of this election i mean you're not going to catch me being a leftist out in the street screaming or crying but um, I am upset about it happening and I'm really, I'm actually kind of nervous about what's happening and already he's doing a terrible job. Um, I genuinely hope that he does well, but I disagree. I disagree with everything that he says. And I, I was actually watching TV with my mom last night. We were watching the news and she shut it off when Biden's face popped up. She's like, I can't even look at his face. He's so disgusting. So I don't like I don't like Biden, and I'm I'm just really sad that the election happened the way it did. So, yeah, and it's funny. I had a video that said, um, "Don't worry about fraud." You know, don't worry about fraud um, because these things are happening. But that video, which didn't age very well, was basically on the premise that the people who are in charge of our checks and balance system would actually do their jobs, right? They didn't. Yeah, I mean, I can go the three. <laughs> You, you, I, I got to go into counseling for this. <laughs> you look at Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and you know, you look at you know Georgia. I mean, there's a constitutional on the book stuff where they couldn't, have, they shouldn't have done that. They were. I don't want to get started. I'm, I'm getting worked up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, let's just jump. Let's just skip subjects here. Let's talk about Israel. Because you said also, um, um, Benjamin, that not yet, yet mm, mm, Benjamin Netanyahu was another person that you admire, and yeah. I admire him too. And uh, he is a person who is 
very much like Trump in his own little world. Where yes. he, he and, and if you go back to the days with Arafat and go back to the days of you know the whole PLO movement and they were they're still there and you just it was where they were actually doing incursions every other weekend, right? Mm-hmm. Um and now that it, it, it we have bus bombings every other every other weekend. He's been through a lot and the whole country's been through a lot. And tell me about uh him and your and 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 just not just him, but the relationship between United States and Israel, because I read a clip here where it said that the House press secretary wouldn't or the White House wouldn't acknowledge that Israel was an ally of the United States. Yeah. So are you asking like for me to talk about Israel and like why I support it or what's sorry, what's the question? Well, the question is, is essentially uh, Netanyahu as a sec- Netanyahu as a segue into his position with Israel and how it's working and how you, we feel that can um go forward if the United States doesn't see them as an ally. Yeah, that was one of the reasons why I don't like Biden is he has specifically stated, um, even I think even before he went into office, he said that he will be sympathetic towards the Palestinians. Now, I don't know what your viewers think of Palestine, but honestly, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan. I don't like the Palestinian Authority there are many people in Palestine who want peace between Israel, who want peace with Israel, but they're being brainwashed by their government. And the Palestinian Authority is literally paying its own citizens to dig terror tunnels into Israel and kill innocent Israeli families. So that was one of the big reasons why I love Trump so much. Also, his support of Israel and the fact that he relocated the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem was just incredible. And the fact that so many people got so mad about that was crazy. And more people need to stand up for the United States-Israeli relationship because Israel is the only true democracy in the Middle East. And it's surrounded by countries that want it to just be destroyed. They want to blow it off the face of the planet. And in reality, Israel has tried negotiating with other countries around the world. They're actually giving doses of vaccines to many countries. In Africa, they're giving doses of vaccines to Palestine. Um, They're giving doses of vaccines to many different places. And they have a really good human rights record. I mean, the United Nations will disagree with me on that. And that's another topic we can talk about. But, (laughs) But Israel is just the only true democracy in the Middle East. And they have the same beliefs that we do. And the fact that Jen Psaki has the audacity to even question our relationship with Israel is just mind boggling to me. We need that relationship with them because if we ever go to war in the Middle East and you can have your own opinions on Israel and the, and the Israeli defense forces, but they're a powerful military. Like you do not, you do not question their military force on the battlefield. They are crazy. And um, I'm hoping to go to Israel this summer with Christians United for Israel, an organization that I'm a part of. I'm a student ambassador with Christians United for Israel. And Israel is just something I'm super passionate about. And I'm also really passionate about combating anti-Semitism on college campuses. And I'm really grateful for the Israeli United States relationship. And I'm really grateful to work in many organizations around the country to fight for this relationship. And I encourage your viewers to do, to do the same thing. Oh, uh, they're hundred percent on board. I mean, from what you just told me, uh, can you explain what terror tunnels are for people who don't know, know what those are? Yeah. So terror tunnels are basically, so the Palestinian authority has secretly paid their citizens to go and dig tunnels. Now these tunnels provide entryways into different parts of Israel where Palestinian citizens are being paid by the Palestinian Authority to dig these tunnels that provide entryways into Israel to kill innocent Israeli families and to kill innocent Jewish people, innocent Christians, etc. Um, so that's mostly what those terror, terror tunnels are for. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I have a huge heart for Israel. Uh, as, as, a, as a Christian, we share the same the same God. Um, of course, we, we we recognize Christ as as Lord and Savior, they recognize as a Messiah that come, but outside of that, that's pretty much it, right? I mean, and like you said, Israel is the only true democracy over there. They're an oasis in the middle of the desert. They're surrounded by their enemies. You have, you know, 
area that they've given up. You have um, they would constantly negotiate the Golden Heights. We were even offering to give that up at one point, but they were throwing rockets over, rockets over into occupied territories of what they call occupied territories. And it's, I, I agree with you. I think it's the government that's basically brainwashing the people. You know, you have, you know, when Arafat was around, he would say one thing and then he would turn around and do the opposite. And he would appease the PLO or, or, the, uh, or Hamas or uh, Hezbollah or whomever was involved. And then the people were suffering. And then it may look like, oh, my goodness, you know, you have uh, Israel doing the big, bad incursion, being the bad guys. We just had a coffee shop blow up, you know. So what are you going to do? So I think I think and you, the, the human rights violations is, is in, in the United Nations. It's a whole. Oh, my gosh. That's terrible. <laughs> you know, it's, I can't even believe they, they can fix their mouths, even say that. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, the fact that they're literally saying that Israel is committing more human rights violations than China, who's holding Uyghur Muslims in literally concentration camps, by the way. This is a modern day Holocaust yep. that China is committing against the ethnic Muslim population. And they're literally putting that under the rug. They're also letting Iran get away with stuff as well. And then they look at Israel and they're like, oh, well, this happened. So let's just blame Israel for everything that's going on in the world. It's disgusting. And it really makes you think about everything that's going on right now internationally and globally. And the United Nations is just a flawed organization in general. And it's just, it's really sad how they treat Israel. And I hope that someday I can do everything in my power continually, even after I graduate college, to fight for the Israeli United States relationship, because it's super important that we have that really, that we have those relations. It's imperative. You mentioned about uh, about uh, space over there in case of a uh, uh, case of conflict. I remember when Turkey wouldn't give us airspace or or, or land space uh, to fly over Turkey. We had to deal with the logistics nightmare of doing that. So you need to have allies over the area in case things break break open. Right. Um, Strait of Hormuz is, is another good example. You need to have allies over there that can help you. And now you have um, and you mentioned this as something you want to talk about. But you did mention current events. Yeah, do you have um, Biden? Now he's bombing Syria in this proxy war when no one knows what's going on. What do you think about that? Um, Biden is putting our country last. And he, so there's two main differences that I want to mention real quick. So the Biden administration is America last. And the Trump administration put America first. The Trump administration did not, under any circumstances, try to get into any international or global wars. They tried to get us out of those wars. They tried their best to get us out of the Middle East. And now you have Biden. As soon as he gets into office, he's just like, well, I'm just going to bomb Syria. When we, when you have peace in the Middle East, you have peace everywhere else in the world. And Biden just doesn't care. He only cares about power and he only cares about greed. And I'm really hoping that Biden will understand the fact that what he's doing with Syria is awful. And he, he even talked about a really long time ago about citizens dying in blasts. Meanwhile, when you're going abroad and you're casting these missiles down, what people need to realize is there were there are always going to be citizen casualties. Does, but does Biden care about that? No. And it's like, you can't, we, we cannot allow that to happen in the Middle East. And it's despicable that the Biden administration is doing that. And I really hope that they take the time to realize what they're doing because they're erasing so much of what Trump tried to do, which was peace in the Middle East. And he did so many incredible things. And I'm hoping that the Biden administration takes a look at that and says, you know, we don't have any business here anymore. Let's get out. We have, there are so many other things the Biden administration sh should do instead of bombing Syria and killing more civilians. It's just, it's mind boggling to me that he thinks that's even remotely okay. So. Especially when you have an area <laughs> with proximity of so many people, like you have Russia over there, you have Turkey over there, you have Syria, obviously, you have Assad, these people trying to do that. You have Iraq, I'm sorry, not Iraq, Iran. And there we have a lot of people in the area that we don't know who's fighting, who, who's doing what. And we're basically carrying over a, a position from what the Hillary Clinton State Department did when the uh, the Arab summer, when they basically left the big vacuum where you have all these different entities coming in, coming to this vacuum space. And you had, you know, that's where that's coming from. And I think it's almost it's almost as if they almost want that to happen. It's almost as if they want this kind of conflict to continue for whatever purposes. I'm not trying to get tenfold hat conspiracy here, but it's. It doesn't take a rocket science to see the difference between 
the Trump administration and his policy towards the Middle East and, and peace, which he basically ended like three wars, four wars while he was in office, if you, if you include Korea. Um, so to what's going on now, it's, it's really, really, it's really fascinating. And I like you just hope that he's competent enough to last two years and that we can secondly get voter integrity in the, in the place so we can get some of these people out of there so we can at least have some gridlock. Oh yeah. <laughs> that needs to be worked on for sure. So yeah, I think gridlock would be great right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and well, I'm just, I'm just going to say this. I'm just tired of, I'm, I'm tired of Republicans bending the knee and keeling over and just yeah. giving over. It's just so, can you have any self-respect? I know. I mean, and Trump gave everyone the roadmap of how to do it. If you look at the election, I don't talk too much on here, but if you look at the election, you saw that every that the Republican Party basically kicked tail everywhere, including the White House, even though they turned out the way he wanted to. But at the lower seats, the congressional seats, they crushed it. And who went in there were people who are America first candidates and people like yourself are going to be the ones running this country. Yeah, I hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I hope I win my election when I run. <laughs> well, let me know. I've, I've run campaigns in the past and we could talk offline on that, but I've done a lot with, uh, with politics. And I, I do this now because I, it's, I'm, I'm kind of free to do what I want without having to worry about, you know, parliamentary procedures all the time, but it does have its place. If you have people who are principled and are willing to, to, to do the work. So let me ask you this question. So in terms of politics, you like politicians. I, and I'm sure you have some people who, who you admire. Who are some of the people that you admire or, or you would consider yourself framing yourself after, if, if that's a fair statement, because you're your own person. But who would influence you or inspire you um, from people you admire? Um, first off, Charlie Kirk. I love Charlie. <laughs> um, I love Candace, too. I've, I'm, I plan on rereading her book. If you guys haven't read it, Blackout is incredible. Everyone needs to read it. Um, I love Anna Paulina too. She works with PragerU. I love Dennis Prager. He's a huge mentor to me. I love Will Witt. I used to love Nikki Haley and now she's a rhino. So that's lovely. Um, and I love Ted Cruz. I hope to be just like him someday. I love his views on the constitution. I love just like taking time off of my schoolwork to like sit down and watch him on the Senate floor. It's he's incredible. And he's someone that I love. And I also love Dave Rubin. I, I actually saw Dave Rubin at the student action summit uh, for turning point USA back in 2019. And I literally started fangirling. I forgot my name and I ran into the bathroom and cried. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the people that I really look up to, but and definitely Donald Trump, for sure. He's awesome. And there, there's so many people. Like, how much time do you have? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm going to be up all night anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot to do. I got a lot to do. Um, those are all great people. And uh, your, your list, I think you had uh, your list of your top five people who you are on your debates team. I'd sub one person out and I'd put Jordan Peterson in there. Yeah. The problem, I'm sorry. Yes, I love Jordan Peterson. But the, but the problem with him, he's just so smart that no one's gonna, no one's gonna. He's gonna be like, well, okay, we'll we'll move on because we don't understand what he said. <laughs> so it's like, because <laughs> I mean, he's just so intellectual. And if if, if you mentioned ben, ben Shapiro too, there's a there's an interview. Yeah. I, if, you, if you don't have it, you see the one with him, Ben Shapiro, and Jordan Peterson. Yes. He, the, the is, is that amazing? I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, these people. He, he made Jordan. He made Ben Shapiro look kind of like average, right? But they were bouncing. Uh, they're bouncing off ideas that were so high level and so. You got. I mean, it just takes a while to just watch that and just they absorb into you and just the the inspiration behind what's going on and what the motivation of the left really is. It was really, really a fascinating discussion. I was like, wow, this is kind of thing. So. Yeah, and another person I love is Alex Clark. She's uh, she does Pop Politics, a daily show with Turning Point USA. And oh my gosh, I love her. She did a What's really good video. Um, Alex Clark. Okay. Yeah, she did a video on the Equality Act that everyone should watch. I love her. Yeah. She's a queen. I would love to be like her. So I'm gonna find that link and put it in the description here as well. So if you guys don't know, I've never I may have seen her, but I'm not familiar with her directly. Um, 
But if you want to talk about Candace Owens, I'm like one of her biggest apologists. I mean, I got several videos on here on Candace. Um, I just love her to death. And I did a book review on uh, on Blackout, and uh, I read that. Uh, it's just a fast. It's a great book, and it and it's just it's like it's almost it's not just about her story as much as it is a roadmap to you know being conservative. It's almost like it's almost like conservatism for dummies almost. And I don't want to be disrespectful there because that's based on a series of books that came out in the '90s. But it, it was almost like it dumbed it down to a level that m made it easier to digest from a perspective that you wouldn't typically hear from. Because she's not a scholar; she's not, and you know, she's smart and intellectual, but she's not like a Jordan Peterson or someone who's come from academia as, as per se. But it's just real life experiences that stuff she's done with, with, with. And she was very open, and transparent. And I was like, wow, this is this is a powerful book. Yes, definitely. So, okay, cool. So let me ask you this question here in terms of um, higher education, in terms of college campuses, because that's obviously where you are. Um, now, right now with, with the COVID going on right now, you're kind of doing remote type of stuff there. How do you feel it's going to, life's going to change when you, we get back to, to life? Do you, and uh, I'll leave it at that. What do you think it's going to look like once you are able to get in the classes together uh, in terms of, acceptance in terms of academia in terms of how you know they're going to try to change the culture to a leftist narrative more openly or is it going to be more of the same do you think um well they're already trying to do that on my zoom classes so my one of my professors actually wanted us to all put our pronouns on our zoom name by our zoom names and um i think like to get back to normal some of my professors unfortunately just like throughout my time in college not this semester specifically some of them have stated that they don't want to get their vaccines or they don't want to return to normal some of them have said it's easier for me to just stay at home and i'm just like girl i just want to get back to class and be in person and they're making life so difficult right. um, so I'm hoping that we do get to, I hope we get back to normal soon, but honestly, I just think right now it's just very unpredictable, but I'm hoping things change in the near future. You mentioned something also on your videos about in terms of college students and being home. And I hadn't thought about this and I'm kind of experiencing something personal with uh, some people in my family who are students. Mental health. You mentioned something. Can you talk about, you mentioned briefly on one of your videos about how, it's affecting students' mental health. Yeah. Um, so being, so teenagers like me, we are naturally very keen on seeing people. We love human interaction. I love talking to people. So this pandemic was really hard on me because I hate being in front of my computer and like being on it eight hours a day. That's too much. And so students are really just feeling like they're worthless in this pandemic or they feel really uncertain about the things that are happening. I know for me personally, I had COVID during Christmas and it was one of the most traumatic experiences. In my personal opinion, I was so sick. I had practically every symptom and it was just so hard. It was so difficult. And I think a lot of people are just really scared because I think it's also the fault of the media because they make COVID seem like it's this death illness that like, if you get it, you're going to die. And I just think a lot of people are living in fear right now. And I think that students especially feel like they, it's super stressful to do your work on Zoom. And it's also super stressful to have online classes because you don't get a lot of sleep, you're up all night, and then you have to get up at 8 a.m. to like go on a class. Sometimes your Wi-Fi doesn't work, so you're freaking out that like while your Wi-Fi is not working, then you're worried that you're missing something that might be on your next exam. So yeah. you're like rushing to like try to get everything done on time. And then sometimes like the professor's Wi-Fi doesn't work, and it's just like it's crazy. And so mental health is taking a huge toll on Americans and that's something a lot of people don't talk about. And I know a lot of people who have gotten COVID. Um, and unfortunately, it's just, it's a scary time that we're living in. And it's very unpredictable. And a lot of people are really anxious and depressed. And it's just, it's really taking a toll on just mental health in our country. And I'm hoping that 
we open again and then you'll start to see mental health rates go up. But it's really unfortunate to me seeing politicians not talk about it in the media. And as a student, I deal with that every day. Like I deal with stress. I deal with like not anxiety. I don't want to sound like a victim, like a student, like a re regular college student, but college is difficult and having it on like remote online learning is even harder. Um, so I'm hoping we get back to normal soon. And I think the fear that's happening right now and how unpredictable life is, I think that's making students just, I think it's just really difficult, especially for certain families who have to be away from their families that are, that can't be around their family members. Um, I know people who haven't seen their grandparents in years yep. um, or they haven't, or they're terrified that they're, that their grandparents are going to get sick and then pass away. And so there's a lot of people who can't be with their families. And my heart breaks for people right now who are in their homes by them, by themselves in front of a computer. Like it's awful. So it's just really sad. And that, but that's why we need to pray more in society and hopefully things get back to normal soon. I, you said that's almost like a mic drop there. <laughs> that's how, and I'm glad you brought that up because I had no idea. And I have a kid who's actually in college. And um, so, yeah. And I have a one that's about to, even though she may not go to college because she understands trade schools may be actually more lucrative, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but the pressure that's on your generation is I can't even fathom to believe or understand. But a lot of us don't even think about it because we're on our own little world and we don't, you know, we don't. So I'm glad people are hearing what you're saying from a person who's actually going through it and experiencing it. So that perspective is actually uh, absolutely why I want you to come on this uh, program and, and talk. And so I forgot what I was going to say here, but, um, th th you know, one of the things that I think uh, that, that, that kids today really need is, is just uh, that level of, of encouragement to know that you're not in your in your box by yourself, and which is what I was going to say, which I remember just now, is that lockdown for everyone is not the same thing, right? A lockdown for some people is not it's not bad because they have like you know a, a ten thousand square foot home, right? But what about the person who who's living maybe in Aaron City or maybe in a trailer park somewhere, and they don't have that, so they're literally trapped depending on what state you're living in, they're literally in a prison, and and or or, or even worse, what about people who are who are who are shut in through nursing sent homes or centers or, or home or, or you know, in the hospitals or whatever it is, I think we need to have a better perspective as you so eloquently um, made me aware of more passionate and more prayerful when it comes to people in our society. I think that's, that's what's going to make people understand conservatives a lot better and look at us in a, lot, in a lot of different light than we're not just these people that are it's a caricature image of what they think they see, you know? Um, which, by the way, those pictures on Capitol Hill were ridiculous because they weren't conservatives. They were Antifa. They even said they were Antifa. But they I digress. People in our in the conservative movement, I had friends who were at the Capitol on January 6th. And one of them, um, the professor at her university, threatened her expulsion because she went to the Capitol. My friends were not violent. They did not go into violence. And... I remember just like hearing their experiences. I had a friend of mine who called me right after everything happened. She was crying on the phone with me for three hours. And someone from a news media outlet was going out and trying to dox college students. And she was in this picture that this person from this news media outlet was taking. And he, I'm so angry that he tried to do that to college students who felt like their voices weren't heard and I condemn everything that happened on January 6th. I thought it was disgusting and just all right, awful, but you have to understand like people feel like they weren't heard and people feel like people genuinely felt like they were, I mean, Glenn Beck said this so eloquently, they felt like they were gum at the bottom of someone's shoe and it's really upsetting. And so my heart hurts for my friends who weren't partaking in any violent actions and the FBI knocked on their door, which is crazy. And it's just, it's so heartbreaking. So um, I condemn the violence that happened, but it's so, it's just, it's awful. I could go on for three hours about it, but I don't support violence. I condemn violence in all shapes and forms from both sides of the political spectrum. 
but it's just it's so sad to see how people are really trying to ruin the lives of citizens who weren't partaking in anything violent and now they're trying to make it so that they get fired from their jobs expelled from their universities it's heartbreaking and i'm hoping people take the time and realize that it's so it's just it's awful and it my heart breaks for people like that who weren't doing anything violent and now they have to pay the consequences too because of some violent people at the capitol breaking into windows and trying to hurt police officers and doing all this disgusting things on january 6th and then you have people in the morning when they heard president trump speak who were singing the national anthem doing things like that and I just, I genuinely feel like we are going to have to pay for January 6th for the rest of our lives. Even if you condemn it as a conservative, you continually have to condemn it on the daily when in reality, everyone should like just stand up against violence. It's ridiculous. Right. I a hundred percent agree. And not only that, but the ramifications to talk, talk about history. If you talk, look at the French revolution, where it got to the point where people were actually turning the neighbors in. And some of it, it wasn't even because they did anything. Just They were just mad because they didn't cut their grass. So, well, I don't like you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to report you. And so in the, the more you know history, the more you actually end up knowing that you can go there if you don't acknowledge that. So that's the biggest issue and, and bigger issue to me. And I agree. I think we're going to be living this down for, um, for a long time, if not for the rest of our lives. You're probably exactly right. They're going to say, we'll look back, whatever. Because we're still looking at stuff that was... You know, they're still, they're still talking about Watergate, you know, um, and putting that on all Republicans. Anyway, so, but let me just say this. I mean, in terms of that, cancel culture, okay? What's your thoughts, and you mentioned some of this before, which you've experienced being canceled, the big tech, whatever. I think we already covered this a little bit, but uh, what's your thoughts on cancel culture in the, in the realm of your neighbor turning you in based on things that they perceive? Is that going to be, um, and I have a video coming up on that and even one beyond that was dealing with deep fakes, which I won't get to too much now, but it's just yeah. high, high tech. You may have seen those before where they impose an image on someone that tech's only going to get better. But anyway, before I do that, what's your thoughts on terms of where we're going with cancel culture? Do you think it's going to swell down or do you think we're going to actually see it go to the point where it's going to be, I don't know, uh, unresolvable when it comes to defending ourselves? I think right now it's kind of in, it's kind of unpredictable to say, um, but I genuinely believe that it's Mark, that it's cultural Marxism. This is literally what other countries are doing. Like there's a book that I'm reading right now. It's by a survivor who actually fled North Korea to come to the United States. And there are parts of cancel culture that are very prevalent in this country that happened in North Korea. And you have different places around the world that, are just turning people in if you say one wrong thing you will get turned in and that's not what our country was founded upon or based upon and it's literally just foundationally cultural marxism and i'm hoping it stops soon yeah you mentioned that in your first video that i watched i think it was your one on freedom of speech and you mentioned something here earlier i wrote, took a quick note here something about the, the supreme court or, or, or appellate court said that free speech zones or whatever it was, was well, whatever you said was unconstitutional on college campuses. It sounds like they're not even abiding by our, their own um, decisions by their own Supreme Courts and by their own um, appellate courts. Yeah, um, the Supreme Court recently said, I don't remember when it was, but they said that hate speech is against the law. Like no one can define what it is. And you have all these videos of people doing man on the street interviews, asking leftists or liberals on college campuses about hate speech. And they're so quick to be so, they, they have so much emotion about it, but they can't define it. And so right. the Supreme Court said, it's so hard to define. How do you know if someone's being hateful and what exactly is hate speech? And only having certain places on campuses that you can go and give your opinions or say certain things. They basically said, Supreme Court justices in particular, said that it goes against the law and that it's unconstitutional. That's good. That's we need that. I need that. So um, great. That's awesome to clarify. So we have about a minute left in terms of um, where we are. Um, gonna 
um, keep you. You can stay as long as you want, but I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, a couple more questions I have here, uh, just in general. What do you think? And you can personalize this to yourself or just the country. What challenges do you think we're we're looking at? I'll just put it the next two years. I think it's about standing up for our own values. I think the Biden administration has done everything in their power to try and erase conservative viewpoints off the face of the planet. And I think it's about in these next two years, I think it's about people waking up and realizing that this administration might or they already are destroying America. And it's up to us as a generation to stand up and speak out against what this administration is doing. And I think in the next two years, it's also about fighting against socialism, communism, and Marxism that so many of my generation are fighting for. And a lot of people on my college campus in particular have even stated that they want or would vote for a socialist candidate. So like AOC or Bernie Sanders, when in reality, they also talk about and they boast about democratic socialism when in reality, democratic socialism is literally just socialism. That's all it is. And so I'm hoping that people take the time and realize that, you know, socialism and communism is not great. Socialism is awful. Socialism sucks. It tears people apart. There's no competition. You are not an individual in under socialist law, under communist law, under Marxist law. And the people, you see people on my college campus, especially before things went online, I saw someone genuinely walk around on campus wearing a Che Guevara shirt. And they literally, like they, when I asked them, because I was tabling for an organization that I was a part of, I asked them why they were wearing that shirt. And they said that Che Guevara is an icon or Mao Zedong is an icon. And in reality, Che Guevara literally enslaved members of the LGBTQ community. And I hope that in these next two years, people take the time to do their own research. And I hope people take the time and realize that socialism is detrimental. This is the last place on earth for freedom. And we need to continue to fight for freedom. And we need to stand up against socialism being implemented in this country because it's awful, it's disgusting, and these policies will tear people apart and it will destroy our country. So I'm hoping in the next two years, people will fight against socialism. And I'm hoping that in the next two years, people will realize that the Biden administration literally being authoritarian is not helping our country whatsoever. And I hope people realize that liberal policies don't really work. And I'm hoping more people wake up and do their own research. Wow. That's, um, Kira, that's awesome. I was going to say, um, about, talk about world views there, but I think you covered that as well. Um, I, I will, I will, uh, piggyback a little bit there and, and, and first say, I hundred percent agree. I think you just said, I was explaining to my daughter earlier, she's in high school, you know, cause she was, she's going through some of the stuff and trying to figure out things out. And I was like, you know, well, socialism, what she's kind of coming my way, which I'm kind of amazed with, but I was trying to explain to her about socialism in terms of why it's so deadly. And it comes down to the fact of its worldview essentially being that it's humanism, right? It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's it, there is no God. Okay. God's not the creator. And so if you do that through the logical framework of, of thinking, if there's no God, there's no consequences, there's no consequences. I can do what I want. I got my own values. And therefore you have the system in place that assumes that we're getting bigger, better, and stronger. Like in Star Trek, they were evolving to a higher, no, that's not what happened. It's actually the opposite. Right. And so, which are diametrically opposed to each other. And so that's why it's so dangerous because it's my values. If I'm in charge, my values are supersede yours because I'm more evolved than you are or whatever you want to look at it. So yeah. it's an evil thing. And, 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 and until you can look at it that way, that's why you see Paul Pot in, in Cambodia. That's why you see Stalin, you see uh, Hitler, whatever. These guys, they had these mindsets. Even the people in Columbine, University of Columbine, when they did the shooting, they did it on Hitler's birthday because they were trying to advanced white supremacism in the, in the nature of humanism because they thought that people were more evolved. So we're going to help a, people, they're going to help the, the race along. We're going to help the species along, which is why they shot the black gentleman because they thought he was not evolved. They killed uh, Cassie because she was a Christian. And that mentality is so dangerous. And so people need to understand it's not just socialism, not, not just getting a paycheck. It's about human existence. And if it's gone unchecked, 
We have a history of that. 150 million people in the last century alone, if not, you know, way more than that. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to just thank you so much for coming on here. And I want to, I, I ask my, most people who, who come on this program and you know, it's a, as my, my closing question, if you had everything that you needed to basically make things the way you want it to happen, um, or put it this way, if you could do anything you could right now and you had the power to do it, uh, what would you do to advance what we just talked about today? I would fight back against socialism. Um, and I would also do everything in my power to fight back against big tech. And I really want to encourage everyone watching this to stand up. And if you're silent about the things that are happening in our country right now, you're part of the problem. I don't care if you're liberal. I don't care if you're conservative. Now is not the time to be silent. And it's the time. And I really just want to try and use my voice to hopefully big, build a big, a bigger audience. But I also just really want to encourage people to think for themselves. And I'm hoping people at the end of the day realize that we live in the greatest country on the face of the planet and we need to continue fighting for freedom in this country. Amen to that. And thank you so much um, uh, uh, for coming on because I think you know, we talked about a lot of subjects here. I'd love to have you back. In fact, if you got a second, we'll talk a little bit uh, after you for a little bit. Uh, I have a couple things to talk to you about. Um, but uh, Kira, so much thanks and love for, for you coming on. And everyone who on this uh, channel who's seen this video, go check out her social media. Check out her, her YouTube channel. Please subscribe to her channel. If you want to um, send her some, some, some love financially, I'm not sure if you have monetization on your channel yet. But do what you can to support this young lady. She's going to be here. She's she's very talented. She's got great opinions. She has much courage and a, and, a, and just in an area that we have no idea for my generation of what she's going through in her generation. But we need to encourage people such as Akira and uh, to to encourage and do, and do more. So Akira, uh, thank you so much for for coming on here again. And um, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, where you where we can people can find you? You can find the links below. But if you can tell the audience where we can find you and how we can support you. Yeah, so you can find me on my YouTube channel. My YouTube is Kira Bowlby. You can also find me on my Telegram, which is where I will connect with people directly. And you can find my blog posts and things like that. Um, my blog post has recently gone against community guidelines on Facebook and Instagram. And you can find me on Telegram. I post new YouTube videos on there and I can connect with you guys on there as well. My Telegram is Kira Mary and Carol Bowlby. You can find me on Instagram. My Instagram is the Kira Bulby. And then I have another Instagram in case Instagram decides to, to delete me called real Kira Bulby. And you can also find me on my political Facebook page, Kira Marion Carol Bulby. And you can also find me on my other Facebook page. Um, just send me a friend request. I'll accept you. And my Facebook page is just Kira Bulby. You only get 5,000 friends, so you guys better hurry up for that one. So that's, that's going to fill up fast. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, well, thank you so much. And um, everyone else, this is uh, Kira. She's going to be around here. Hopefully, she'll come back on the show um, uh, yeah. sooner, sooner than later. And um, so, again, if you're just here for the first time, I, I rec uh, hope you would subscribe to what we're doing. Again, support Kira. And uh, hit that join button if you want to help support us. And as always, please check out some content that we have right here.